Good morning. Turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 1, and we'll be beginning in just a moment. Philippians chapter 1, C.S. Lewis said, Joy is the unsatisfied desire which itself is more desirable than any other satisfaction. That is, what we want more than anything else is joy, but we often scratch and crawl and prowl to try to receive it, and we just don't know where to turn to get it. But joy is something that every one of us wants, every one of us needs, but we often don't know how to properly seek after it, how to lay hold on it. The words joy, rejoice, or rejoicing occur over 400 times throughout the Bible. Just by sheer word count, we're impressed with the fact that it's an extremely important concept. In 1 John 1 and verse 4, the Bible tells Christians that our joy can be full. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, Christians are told to rejoice always or rejoice evermore. It's the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, and it's what the kingdom of God is all about. Romans 14, 17, Paul says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. With all that the Bible says about joy, though, the question is, are Christians really joyful? I want you to stop for a minute and just think, if you're a Christian, just think about this one truth, this one fact, what people describe you and me as people of joy, because the Bible says we're supposed to be joyful individuals. Just like now, people in Bible times struggle with this idea. They sought it. They pursued it. They wanted to have this joy. It's interesting to read Ecclesiastes 2, the first 11 verses, and read about a man who had women, gold, entertainment, and pleasure, and yet his life was devoid of joy. All that Solomon sought to make him happy never really could. But then you turn your Bible to the book of Philippians, and you read about a man that, though in prison, it's not, a, it's not a letter soaked in tears, but joy leaps off every page. The book of Philippians has long been called Paul's epistle of joy, and that's because he mentions it 16 times in these four chapters. It's in chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 1, verse 25, he mentions joy twice in chapter 2. and verse 2, verse 25, it's in the first verse of chapter 3, the famous rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice of chapter 4, and again in chapter 4, verse 10. Paul wanted these Christians to know one thing, we can have joy in Christ, and there's nothing the world can do about it. And so, Paul says, I want you to always rejoice. The question I have is, was Paul an anomaly? Was Paul unique? Was he the only person that could have joy in all circumstances, though his world was caving in? That most certainly can't be true, because the Bible says that Jesus came into the world to bring joy to everybody in it, if they would believe on him. And so, how can we have joy in all circumstances? How can we do it? That's what we're going to look at this morning from Philippians chapter 1. In the first place, we can receive God's grace and peace. The book of Philippians opens like many of the other New Testament letters, and that is in Philippians 1 and verse 1, Paul says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to the saints which are in Philippi, to the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul opens with a greeting. He tells you who's with him. It's Paul and his servant Timothy, and then he talks about the standing of those that are in Christ Jesus, those at Philippi. And then in verse 2, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is more than just a greeting that Paul uses in his letters before he gets to the serious stuff. We sometimes shoot over the beginning and the end of these epistles, but this is important. What Paul says in Philippians 1 and verse 2 is foundational for what he'll say throughout the rest of the letter, and he begins it with these words, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The common greeting in the Greco-Roman world in which Paul lived, it was to say greetings to you. Somebody, instead of saying hello, they would say greetings. And in the original language, that word for greetings is very similar to the word that Paul uses for grace. Paul changes a few words, but it changes everything. Paul goes from greetings to grace, and then he couples that with what was normally the Hebrew greeting of shalom, peace to you. And Paul says that's what you get from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and notice that Paul ends this letter by talking about the grace that comes to you. Philippians 4.23, Paul says, grace be with you all. In chapter 4, in verse 7, and in verse 9, Paul says the peace of God, it passes all understanding, and it'll keep your heart and mind, which is in Christ Jesus. If we really want to have joyful lives, it's to the degree that we receive the grace and peace that God is extending to us. Now, what does that mean? Grace is the kindness that God gives to us through his Son. The grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men, Titus 2.11, 
It's the grace of God that caused Jesus to come to the world. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. The grace of God is what motivates God to be kind to us. It's that kindness. You might say the niceness of God. And that's what Paul says God extends toward us. And then when we receive that, God says, here's kindness. Here's me being nice to humanity. And then when we receive it, we get peace. And if we want to be joyful people, it's to the degree that we receive those truths. What we need most from God are these two things, his grace and peace. No wonder the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way, what, rejoicing, Acts 8.39, because he had laid hold on both of these things. What you and I need most from God is not a financial blessing, though those are great when they come. We need his peace. The Business Insider talked about people who had won the lottery. And in 2019, the Powerball jackpot was at $625 million. And they were writing to tell people, don't go out and buy a ticket. And there were several reasons. Number one, they said, when you do the math, logistically speaking, you've got a very low probability of winning it all. And then secondly, they list 20 people who had previously won similar sums of money who were now, number one, broke, but number two, more miserable than they were before. You know why? The money didn't make them happy. It wouldn't work. So Paul says, listen, there's grace and peace. It's from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not all. The point is for us, we've got to receive it. Some of us struggle with this point. I know Vince just led us in a song about the grace of God, but some of us struggle with receiving the grace of God. We really like to work. We really like to earn it. We want to exercise grit and human exertion. And so when God says, I'm giving you something in grace, we say, no, I won't take anything. I want to earn it. Paul says, receive the grace of God. I heard a story about a man. He was with his friend. He was from up north, one of those northerners, you know, and they were coming down south, and they stopped at a restaurant to eat breakfast. And when they stopped to eat breakfast, he ordered his food, and then the waitress brought him out some grits. And, of course, he said, what's a grit? And she said, here it is. He said, I didn't order it and I'm not paying for it. And she looked at him and said, sir, down here, you don't order it, and you don't pay for it. You just get it. And that's grace. You don't order it. You don't pay for it. You just get it. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though we are rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. It's not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2 and verse 9. If we really want joy, it's to the degree that we realize through God's grace we can have peace and be on good terms with God, and that's the most important thing in the world. And people that really receive that and really know it, you can't take joy from them. They're truly happy. He made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20. He came and made peace between Jew and Gentile, Ephesians 2.14. And we can lay hold on that peace and that grace if we receive it in Christ. So far as we know, before Paul became a Christian, he was never imprisoned. He was never beaten. He never went through many of the things that he would go through after becoming a Christian. And yet, to the surprise of all of us, I would say Paul is happier after the fact, after becoming a Christian and experiencing more physical hardship than he ever was before. How could that be the case? Physically, he was more comfortable and at ease before coming into Christ. After that, his life was often turbulent, unstable, unpredictable, and yet he says, I'm happier now than I was then. How could it be? It's because Paul received the grace and peace. He described it this way in 1 Timothy 1.14. The grace of our Lord is exceeding and abundant upon me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. It made all the difference for Paul, and it'll make all the difference for us. What we're saying in this first point in a word is this. If you really want to be a happy person, if you really want joy, become a Christian. You see, God extends grace, and when you lay hold on that by obeying the gospel, the Bible says you'll have peace, peace of mind, peace of soul, and you can really experience true joy. Number two, if we want joy in all circumstances, we've got to be people that remember the good things. Look at verse three. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always and every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, do you remember what happened to Paul when he went to Philippi? Last week, we preached about it in Acts 16 and verses 23 through 26. When Paul went to Philippi, he was arrested, beaten, and involved in an earthquake. And yet, Paul says in Philippians 1, every time I think about you, Philippians, I start thanking God upon every remembrance of you. When Paul thought about his time in Philippi, he didn't think about the hardships. He thought about these brethren. Paul remembered the good things. Few people suffered as much as Paul. 
If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30, you'll read about all of the suffering that was his. He talks about being beat five times with about 39 stripes by the Jews. He talks about being shipwrecked and being homeless. He talks about being beaten with rods, being naked and hungry, shipwrecked and fasting, suffering. Paul had been robbed. How could Paul go through things like he described in 2 Corinthians 11 and things that we read about in Acts 16 and yet have this memory that says, when I think about Philippi, I think about you and I thank God every time. It's because Paul practiced what he preached. If you look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, what Paul tells the Philippians to do and what he tells us to do is what Paul did himself. Philippians 4 and verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, and the God of peace will be with you. That's what Paul practiced, and that's what Paul wanted other people to do as well. And so Paul said, I thought on good things. This is not Paul saying, well, I just forgot that those things happened. Paul is not being dishonest about the hardship he went through, but Paul had choices like every one of us does. Paul could remember the beatings, or Paul could remember the brethren. Paul could remember the shackles that bound him in Philippi or the souls that were saved. He could remember the mistreatment that he received or the rich relationships that he forged with those brethren. And you know which one he chose. In Philippians 4 and verse 15, he tells the Philippians, you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again to my necessity, not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And I have all and am full. I've received of Epaphroditus, the sweet smelling offering and gift which you gave to me. Paul says, I remember the fellowship we enjoyed in the gospel, which you did on my behalf. And that fuels my thought processes. You want joy in all circumstances, regardless of what's going on around you. Remember the good things. Too many of us have a ready recollection of all of the bad that's happened to us and a case of willful amnesia concerning all of the good that's ever happened in our lives. Our cup, like David said in Psalm 23, 5, truly does run over, but we struggle to remember it, don't we? The psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God, Psalm 46, 10. We don't just need to be still and know that he's God, though. We need to be still and know that he's good that God's poured in blessings on our life, that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, and whom is no variation, neither shadow of turning, James 1, 17, and knowledge of that goodness, as we allow it to turn over again and again in our minds, motivates us to say, you know what? I'm going to remember the good things. You want to be joyful, say, I'm going to choose to remember the good things that have happened to me. Our failure to do this allows dissatisfaction to creep in, And it allows us to become discontent, and we forget about how good God's been to us. And we struggle to recall the goodness that Paul says every one of us so desperately needs. We need to be people that say, I'm going to remember the good things. When you go home, you can't control who's going to knock on your door. You can't control who's going to ring the doorbell. People just do that. They might have various reasons for doing it. You can't control it. But you can control who you open the door for, who you invite in, and who you give something to drink and say, hey, you can sit on the couch. As it relates to our minds and our hearts, you can't control what's going to come knocking. You really can't. But you can control who and what you invite in, who you offer a seat to, and who you say, we're going to converse. I'm going to allow you to take up residence in my mind. Now, that's up to us. And we've got to choose the good. Audrey Hepburn said, if everything in my life caved in today, I would remember all of the good, all of the worthwhile, all of the blessings. She said, I wouldn't remember the miscarriages. I wouldn't remember the hardships. I wouldn't remember my dad leaving home. I would remember all of the good that has come my way, and that would have been enough. She wasn't creating anything new. That's what Paul had already taught in Philippians 1 and in places like Romans chapter 5, where he says we have peace with God, and he allowed those thoughts to flood his mind, and we need to do the same thing. Think about people in the Old Testament who got this right, this idea about remembering the good things. When Jacob was coming back into Palestine and Genesis 32 and verse 10, he says, God, I came across this this river with a staff in my hand, and look, you brought me back two companies full. He wasn't thinking about the corruption of his father-in-law and all the mistreatment. Jacob remembered the good. David didn't think about how often Saul chased him. 
He thought about surely goodness and mercy will follow me, will chase me all the days of my life. David remembered the good. Though Job had 10 funerals in one day. Now, you've suffered hardship. You've never had 10 funerals in a day. Job had 10 funerals in one day. And what Job chose to remember was not all that God had taken away, but all that he had given. And so he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he fell down in worship. Job 1, 20 and 21. You've got to make a decision. It's not to say that you and I don't go through hard things and hardship. It's just to say we need to reorient our gaze and our thinking toward what really matters. Greg Mantufel, he was diagnosed or a bacteria entered his body called capnosotopha. And it comes, they believe, through some rare interaction. Not all dogs and cats have it, but some of them do. And if they lick you, it can affect your body. This bacteria entered his body. He lost every limb. He's forever confined to a wheelchair. He didn't kill his dog either, by the way. When they interviewed him about his dog, he says, Ellie is a part of this family. I love this dog. It was just a misfortunate event. And he says she's a part of his family. He had a bad experience with his dog. He's not going to let it ruin the relationship. Christian, sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes you have a bad week. Sometimes you have a bad month, a bad year, bad years. But you don't have a bad life because you don't have a bad God. Chin up, Christians. He's good. Psalm 136, 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And we need to remember that. Before we move on to the next point, this is going to take some effort to remember the good, and we need to put some practical things down so that we can cause ourselves to do this. Number one, count your many blessings we sing. Name them one by one. Psalm 116 and verse 12 says, What will I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? Count your many blessings. And see how God has blessed us richly and allow that to motivate us to be the kind of people that God would have us to be. Number two, thank God immediately. When things happen in our lives that are good, we should thank God immediately. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, in everything, give thanks. I know what you think. I think the same thing. Good things happen, sometimes very small things. And we think, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to thank God for that. And we don't do it. And next thing you know, we've forgotten all about it, but we are really quick to remember hardship What about having a praise list instead of just a prayer list? Now, I know in prayer there's praise, but when we talk about a prayer list, what we often mean are requests, petitions, supplications, which are scriptural. You've got a Bible full of those. But what about a praise list? Not just a prayer list. What about a list of things for which I can say I'm praising God for these things? Now, that takes effort. That takes diligence. I've got to be observant and look because the volume of hardship is often turned up louder than the volume of God's blessings. But if I document it, if I remember it, I won't forget. And surround yourself with people who think positively. Job 16, 2, Job said about his friends, miserable comforters are you all. You're all physicians of no value. You don't need people like that. You need people who are going to hold up your hands and help you remember the good, who won't come to the pity parties that you invite them to. They won't feel sorry for you. They're going to say, now, look, you're going through a hard time. But remember how good God's been, and they're going to motivate you in the right way. If we want to be joyful in all circumstances, remember the good. Number three, realize God is working. In verse 6, Paul says, I'm being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul knew that God was still working. And so he says, Christians, I'm joyful and you can be joyful. He says, I'm confident of this very thing, that God always finishes what he starts. What he began in the Philippians as they obeyed the gospel, he was going to keep working until it was finished. Psalm 138 in verse 8 is the Old Testament version of this verse, where the psalmist says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. God will finish what he starts. He always does. He that calls you is faithful, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, God's working. That makes me joyful. The atheist says God does not exist. The theist says he does. The deist says God exists, God wound up the world, but he stepped away and you're all on your own. One of the mistakes that Christians often make is we sometimes think, even if we wouldn't say it, that though God no longer works in the miraculous, he's not working at all. And that's a dreadful mistake to make, to think that it's just you and me out here on our own trying to do everything. Paul knew better, and he encouraged these Christians to know better as well. And so he says, look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 5. They were working. Paul was thanking God for their fellowship in the gospel from the first day. That's their portion. The Philippians are involved, and we're involved. There are things we must do. But it's not just the Philippians, because notice verse 6 of chapter 1. 
he that began a good work will perform it. The Philippians were working, but God was working too. And I would argue God was working more. It's not that you and I are on the same level with God, both shouldering the same load. God is shouldering far more than we ever could. And he's going to fulfill his role and he's going to bring it to a good end. Paul says it elsewhere. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and notice verse 13. He says, God works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He says it in chapter 3 and verse 21. There at the end, the old King James has that whereby he works all things. Our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we look for the Lord Jesus Christ who will subdue all things and change our bodies, he says, according to the working whereby he's able to subdue all things to himself. Some translations have he enables or he's able to exert power. God's working, and Paul knew that, and they needed to know that. Remember that God's working, it's not just you. One man who was always busy but always getting a lot done was approached by his friend because it seemed like he had more hours in a day than anybody else, more days in a month, more months in a year. He said, how do you get everything done all the time? You're just twice as busy as everybody else, but you get it all done. And concerning God, the man responded, you forget that there are two of us working. When they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar was amazed. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 24, he called his officers, and you remember what he said, did we not cast three in the fire? And they said, oh, yes, king. And then in verse 25, behold, I see four, and one among them looks like the son of God or one of the sons of God. There was more than there appeared. We can be joyful in all circumstances if we remember that God's working. Your life and mine comes down to the answer to this question. What do you say? Is God working in your marriage? You say, it's rough. I wish things were better, and I want things fixed now. Well, if it's all up to you and if it's all up to me, we just very well may be doomed. But what if God's working? Amen. Say, I want the congregation to go here. I want the, I want the church to move forward. If you really believe it's just us, you'll be discouraged. But what if God's working? Amen. What about in school and on our jobs? If the answer to the question for us is that God's working, all hope could never be lost. All things work together for good. You know why Romans 8, 28? Because a good God is always working. And so it makes sense that Christians can have hope and remember that God's powerful and at work, and it's not all up to us. And that encourages. Just when I'm about to give up, I remember there are two of us working and not one. When I feel like the load's going to overwhelm me, there are two of us and not just me. Paul says, he that began a good work, he's going to complete it. God finishes what he starts. I've just got to trust him. I've got to believe. I've got to realize that it's not all up to me, but I've got to submit and turn over to him. Next, abound in love. Philippians 1 and verse 9, Paul says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all understanding or discernment, that you may approve of things that are excellent and be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. Paul would say, abound in love. That's what I want you to do. And this was his prayer, right? Paul says, this is my prayer, that you would abound in love. I want you to grow in love. This isn't just a fuzzy feeling. I know that's true because look at the rest of the verse. Paul says, in knowledge and in all discernment, if we really want joy, Paul would say, I want you to grow in love. But this isn't just uh, affection for other people. Paul is talking about true Joy comes from loving the things that God loves. And the only way I learn to love the things that God loves is to know the things that God knows and wants me to know. And so Paul says, I'm praying that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and discernment. Learn to reject the things that would do you harm and receive the things that would be good for your soul. Look at verse 10. Approve of things that are excellent and be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Paul is saying, once you know more of what God wants you to know and you put those things into practice, you know what's coming. Verse 11, the fruit of righteousness. You'll be happier when you do it God's way. That's what Paul is saying. True joy comes from saying to God, order my loves. Don't let me put energy and investment into things that bring you grief and anger. I want to love the things you love. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ephesians 4, 23. Or Romans 12 and verse 2, be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let God change your mind about things. You know, sometimes we say about a person, oh, he or she is book smart, but they don't have common sense. 
And what we mean by that is we would love to let them take the SAT for us, but you probably shouldn't let them bag the groceries because they might put canned goods on the bread, right? We mean this person's very intelligent, at least on the face, but they don't have common sense. Paul is not saying that in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. Paul's saying you need book smarts that are going to give you behavioral modification. Once you learn the right thing, that's great. But then Paul says common sense, you've got to put it into practice. I believe, therefore I behave. That's what Paul's arguing in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. It changes you. And Paul says if you do that, you'll really be happy. You really will. You'll have joy because it'll bring out the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. You'll bear fruit. Paul says, I want you to do the right thing, abound in love. I want you to do it the right way through knowledge and discernment and then receive the right fruit. That fruit will be the fruit of righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ, and all of it. Look at the bottom of verse 11. All of it is to the praise and glory of God. That's what it's all about. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. We live in a world where people long to be happy. People really want to be happy, but the problem is they don't want to do God's will. They don't want to be holy. They just want to be happy. And true joy is not a fleeting happiness, a feeling that you feel for a little time. You know, happiness is, well, I found $20 in my pocket or my favorite ice cream's on sale. Joy is different. Joy is deeper. Joy is something that we can have in all circumstances, no matter what's going on. You can really have joy. It's like a dog with a toy in his mouth that can't be taken from him. Is joy in the heart of a Christian. Though Satan and the world pull and tug, they can't take it. And it's because we abound in love and do the things that Paul would argue for us to do. Now, this is the last one. If we really want joy, we've got to resolve to always live for Jesus. In Philippians 1.27, Paul says, Only let your conversation or manner of life be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come see you or else be absent, I might hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul would say, I want you to live for Jesus all the time. Just make up your mind that you're going to live for Jesus and you'll be joyful. Only let your manner of life, just have one focus. Only let your manner of life be that which is consistent with the gospel of Christ. And when you find things that are not consistent, you just get off that path. If you really want to be joyful, get with Jesus and then stick with him all the way. The Atlantic ran an article about people that don't work very much. And they talked about the fact that many Americans go to work, but they don't work. They surveyed 40 people that said they spend half of their time at work on their own interests. 60% of the people said that they only work half the time. They spend one and a half to two hours daily shopping and doing their own thing. If you were to survey the online engines like Amazon and others, 70% of the purchases that are made are made between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. when people are supposed to be at work. Now, how many of those people, how many of them, if the boss walks by, they really make it like they're working hard. They're really busy then. See, Paul is saying in Philippians 1.27, I don't want to have to babysit your Christianity. That whether I come and see you or be absent, I might hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. If you really want to be happy, don't be a seasonal Christian. If you want true joy, just say, I'm going to live for Jesus always, no matter what. Some of the most miserable people in the world are people that, they love the world too much to really live for Christ. But they know far too much Bible to really go out and live for the world. And so they're stuck betwixt two. They don't know which side to really be on. And so they can't have true happiness, true joy. We talk about Mother's Day, and it is a great day. We honor mothers. And one of the things we often say about mothers is, unlike fathers, they can do 20 things at once, right? They're the great multitaskers. Paul actually wrote in the Harvest, Harvard Business Review, and he said, you can't multitask, so stop trying. Well, maybe some mothers would give him a run for his money and say, oh, no, we can't. He says that we think we're doing two things at once. But what really happens is we quit doing one thing really well. We start doing that one poorly, and we really kind of do this one halfway, and both jobs suffer. Now, I don't know if that's true physically. I've seen some people watch kids and cook and do laundry all at the same time. But I know it's true spiritually. I know that if we try to do two things at once, if we try to live for two kingdoms at a time, we won't really be happy. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same will find it, Matthew 16, 24 and 25. If we really would be happy, live for Jesus all the time. Notice Paul in Philippians 1. Notice verse 20. 
Paul says that in nothing I'll be ashamed, that always now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. Paul decides Jesus is going to be big for me. A magnifying glass doesn't make things bigger. It just makes them appear bigger. Jesus is as big and glorious as he's ever been, always. But Paul says he'll be magnified in my body. Jesus is going to live all over again on this earth, not in his own body, but Paul says now in mine. Look at verse 21. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In verse 23, Paul wants to go somewhere that he describes as being far better. Paul wants to really live for Jesus. If you want joy, just let loose with both hands and live for him. Read your Bible like you've never read it before. Read your Bible, not like there's a test coming Monday and it's Sunday night and you have to cram. I mean, read it like somebody's trying to communicate their love to you in 66 books and letters and historical accounts that can be verified that they are literally breathed out by God. Really read your Bible like there's a God in heaven that you want to know. Pray. Pray like you've never prayed before. Like somebody on the other end, far above the skies, is really listening. Don't just bend your knees and bow your head, but bow your will and pray to God. Serve him. Not like if I don't or else. Serve God like you really love people and you don't know what else you would do with your life otherwise. Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Paul was a debtor to preach it. He was ready to preach it. He just really wanted to live for Jesus. And if we do that, we'll have the joy that Paul had and we can live the Christian life. We can have joy in all circumstances. Paul's in prison, and Paul's as happy and joyful as he's ever been. They should have been writing to Paul, but Paul was writing to them to encourage them to do the right thing. Paul had received the grace and peace that had come from God. He controlled his mind and thought about the right things at the right time, and he chose to think on good things. He knew that God was still working. He was confident of it. Paul didn't say he hoped God was still working. He said, Philippians 1, 6, I'm confident about this. He was always abounding in love, and he just had a center vision. He focused on one thing, not veering to the right or the left, and he glorified God. Self-help books, they fly off the shelves. What people want. They want five or six life hacks, right? Tell me how to live and give me, give me the keys so that I can just go and be happy. How to fix my marriage, how to excel on my job. Just give me the life hacks. And the Bible is not interested in temporary self-help. But the Bible is over and abundant interested in eternal soul help. See, this book isn't going to give us quick life hacks that just help us to briefly modify our lives. It's inviting us into a relationship with a person the eternal God from heaven, and when we come into contact with him, he eternally changes our lives. Paul had the joy of Christ because Paul was a Christian, and that's what we want everybody to have. Maybe you need to obey the gospel. The Bible says that God extends his grace toward us. You don't pay for it. You don't ask for it. Everybody in the world just gets it. At least it's extended to them, but you have to receive it. And you receive the grace of God that brings peace by believing on Jesus as Christ. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. Believing that Jesus is Christ leads one to repent. Acts 17.30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And when we repent, we confess with the mouth what we've already believed in the heart. Romans 10.9 and 10, with confession of the mouth, it's made unto salvation. And then we're immersed in water. And we rise from those waters with our sins forgiven. Acts twenty two sixteen 16 says it's at that point and not a moment before. It's at that point, once I'm baptized, that my sins are washed away. There's no more tranquility between me and God. There's no more animosity, excuse me, between me and God. There's now a peace, a reconciliation, a friendship. And I can have joy. And I can go on my way rejoicing. Maybe you need to do that. We'd love for you to reach out to us. We would be glad to help you in any way. You can email us, call us at the church building. You can let us know how we can help you in that regard. If you're already a Christian, but joy seems elusive, you have spurts of happiness, moments here and there when you really believe that God's working, but overall, you would describe yourself as someone who's really not joyful. I would encourage you to spend some time with the book of Philippians. Look at the things that Paul says and set your, height, set your sights higher than you have before. Think on things eternal. See how blessed you really are to know the one and true living God. And let us pray for you and pray with you if you can. Vince is going to sing a song to encourage us. If we can help you, reach out to us and let us know as we sing this song together.